contact the uh, chief digital officer and one of three managing partners for a uh, startup Swiss luxury brand based in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, we have three partners. I'm in New Jersey. We have our founder and CEO in Geneva, Switzerland, and the third partner is in Paris. Today, we're going to talk about rethinking luxury brands in a digital world. Now, most people, including probably yourselves, do not associate luxury brands with digital, with innovation, uh, with technologies and digital and, and, and so on, and disruption, especially. So I hope in the next 30 minutes here, 29 minutes, that I might be able to change your mind a little bit. So rethinking luxury brands in a digital world. First of all, before we get started, let's talk a little bit about what digital is, because people have come up to me in the past and said, you've got a typo there, or this word doesn't exist. It actually does exist. There's one that's much more popular, it's called Omnichannel, but I like this one, although I couldn't find it good definition that I liked online, so I made one up. So to me, digital is the seamless strategic blending of the physical and digital customer experience. So this way we're all on the same page and we know what we're talking about moving forward. Okay, so uh, in 28 minutes, we're going to address the five following topics. Digital platforms, we're going to talk about retail, we're going to talk about content strategy and storytelling, we're going to talk about authenticity and the importance of authenticity for luxury brands, and then we're going to talk about our favorite marketing generations, namely millennials and the following one, Gen Zs, and find out if the challenge with these, uh, with these market segments are actually real. So first off, let me give you a little bit of context about what La Maison Hubert is so we can understand better what follows here in this, in this session. Uh, so we're a modern luxury brand in the gastronomy, wellness, retail market. What is gastronomy wellness? It's the desire to find well-being by eating wholesome foods, basically, by taking care of yourself. Uh, the wellness market as a whole is really interesting. It's a $4 trillion market globally. And gastronomy is one of the vectors of this market, and it's a very compelling vector, and it's very trending at the moment. However, it's not the only one, right? Because one of these vectors is also upscale and luxury beauty brands. And I like to explain, I love analogies to explain things to people, generally. So when people ask me, well, what are you guys about, what do you do? I say, well, you know, we're a lot like these very expensive, very high-end, very upscale luxury, um, luxury beauty products or cosmetics for personal care. They work outside the body, okay? But we focus on inside the body. So our customers feel good inside and look great outside. So we kind of have this 360 wellness approach there. So we're the same, but different. And what we also do in terms of service offering, we sell both on the experiential side, so we have private events, maybe one person at somebody's home, or perhaps a smaller group of uh, folks who pay a considerable amount of money to hang out with three, three star chefs and artisans who have actually had a hand in making their food. I call it the human ecosystem around the food that you consume. Uh, we sell products, obviously, online at the moment. And our approach to marketing as a whole is really about storytelling. We don't talk about so much about the brand. We don't talk that much about the product. We do talk a lot about the artisans behind the product. We honor them and put them up on a pedestal. And their stories are the stories we like to tell. So in a nutshell, what we do, we basically go out and curate a lot of interesting different categories of products throughout Switzerland and France. We uh, partner with uh, producers, growers, could be people who fish, could be winemakers, could be beekeepers, and so on. People who make jam, for example. In this case, this young lady cultivates about 50 different types of herbal teas in Brittany, France. And she's about 30 years old, she's very young, and she's very good, and she's very famous in Europe, especially in France. So anyway, we went out to meet her, and what we do is we take the product, well, she takes the product, obviously, she farms it, she grows it, she picks it, she processes it, or triages it rather, uh, and then sends it to us. She made two special editions exclusively for our brand, uh, of our herbal tea. So you can't find that anywhere else except on our website at the moment. It's very exclusive. We package this, we slap a QR code on it. I'm gonna talk a lot more about that in a few minutes, but basically it allows us to let the consumer trace the product and find out exactly where it's coming from. And this is writing on a technology platform based on blockchain. Well, I'll talk about that a little bit later. It's kind of interesting. And then finally, obviously, it comes to you, the consumer. Either online, it comes to your house, or on the store shelf somewhere. Great. And then, you know, as I mentioned, we sell them online. We have an e-shop. Whoop-de-doo. Great. Uh, but 
we do have something again that's kind of unique and different about the way we do this and it's called blockchain again we guarantee authenticity of the product with using blockchain so basically it's not us it's not the brand saying hey this is really authentic this really was picked by this person at that time from this patch of earth somewhere in Brittany or somewhere in Switzerland it's mathematically locked through IoT and therefore verifiable through blockchain. So when people get their product, they can scan it and they can actually trace the whole uh, gen genesis of the product. Uh, so basically origination, where it's from, attribution, which is extremely important. These people that are actually growers, um, consumers want to know that these people are actually the ones who picked or made or nurtured their food. Uh, and then they were properly remunerated for it. And then sustainability, that no environment was harmed in the process of either growing or shipping or producing this, this product. So this is, this is kind of our, our, our unique selling proposition. Maybe not unique, but at least one. This is what it looks inside the box. You open the box, got a nice bowl and everything. The herbs are in there. This is our herbal tea. And you can scan this and get all the information you need about the product. Great. So. Um, Interestingly enough, even though obviously we're a digital first brand, or at least I hope to be showing this at this point, um, our entire business model is actually centered around physical retail. And when I say physical retail, I'm not talking about just brick and mortar stores, but any physical delivery mechanism. And I'm going to show you some examples a little bit later. Um, the brand was, the concept was invented in 2014. But a year ago when I joined full time, there was no website. No SEO, no way to find us on Google, no eShop, no mobile-friendly application, basically zero. So we said, listen, we cannot possibly go to physical retail where the actual revenue engine is really located. We must first become a digital brand. Only then can we move on to the next step after digital, physical, and therefore become digital. So we went out and developed a lot of interesting applications not just for fun, but because partly because customers ask us for it and partly because, again, there's a necessity to basically exist. In order to exist, Google has to say, you exist. If you're not on there, it doesn't matter. Right now, if you look us up, we come up in the first page, which is kind of cool. Uh, so we have a website, again, I mentioned, uh, eShop. We have mobile-friendly application, reservation system, which is also QR code-based. We really pull up QR codes at the Maison Hubert. Uh, and an application on the lower right, which is a tablet-based application which people use during live events. Because although our live events are really more of a marketing initiative than anything else, we still want to generate revenue inside those events. So we let people do that on a tablet-based application, which is basically, here's a couple of pages from them. They slide there, basically give them context, tell them who the chefs are uh, tonight, who the artisans are, what's in their food, why. Sometimes we bring in musicians, who are they, where do they come from, qualifications do they have and last but not least they can shop the actual products that they're tasting in their plate right there and then so that's very interesting from a marketing perspective because of course the proximity to the product and more importantly to the person behind the product is a very very significant conversion rate and they can actually just take, pick up the product and take it home and so the interesting thing about this uh, section I wanted to mention is that we, we cobbled this uh, digital platform which is both about content and e-commerce essentially uh, from a multitude of different uh, SaaS applications. Uh, marketing and technology, um, as you probably know, obviously, are, have really kind of meshed together. And, and for me, I think the interesting thing about disruption, or the definition of disruption in marketing, uh, is not so much you know, the nature of the technology, like AI or machine learning. This is all great, and, but, but I think inherently, fundamentally, the disruption comes from the democratization of the technology. Anybody with a fairly decent technical background can actually put this size and breadth of platform together in under a year using tools that are relatively inexpensive and relatively easy to test and use. So you can see here we used everything from uh, reservation platforms to connectivity, social listening, marketing automation, uh, lead generation obviously, blog analytics, QR code, uh, and Wirewax which is a really cool tool that lets us do uh, shoppable videos very big fans of shoppable videos. So, net net, digital means you can exist, digital means you can scale, and this is interesting and important because this goes towards customer acquisition costs, which in our line of, uh, in our industry, in our line of business, is actually a very, very important API, very sensitive. Uh, digital lets you test and pivot very, very quickly. 
uh, digital lets you tell marketing, content platform again, as we all know, and obviously digital helps you sell both online and offline. So speaking of offline, um, I don't think there's a day where you don't read something about retail collapsing in the world. Uh, everybody's going under, and the entire world is now shopping online. It's not a valid business model anymore, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, very depressing. Uh, we, we don't think that's the case, actually. We think it's a matter of evolution and, and morphing uh, rather than death. And so what's, what's the uh, process going on here? Uh, I believe it's really uh, going from a transactional context and system, and purely so, to an experiential system. Retail and in-store presence and other forms of physical retail will shortly look at uh, need to create experience, basically. So the uh, golden KPI of, of, of retail traditionally, which is dollars per square foot, is okay, but not sufficient anymore. You need something that measures memories per lifetime because that's essentially what people are looking for when they go shopping now. And interestingly enough, as we'll see shortly, this is true across most generation and most, most market segments we're looking at. So speaking of which, uh, again, is anybody still shopping? Baby boomers, Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z, is it true that they're completely outside of stores and they're only on their laptops or, or, or mobile devices these days to go shopping? Uh, I don't think so. 67% of Gen Z's prefer to make purchases in stores. Half of millennials shop in physical stores. And from a dem demographic uh, segmentation, only 30% of millennials are online shoppers, which is not insignificant, but certainly not the vast majority. My generation and the previous one, the boomers, make about 64% of that slice. So it's not, the, it's not the case that people are no longer shopping in physical stores. And the reason we think is because there's been a shopping evolution. And if you follow this, uh, this framework from the lower left to the upper left, actually, counterclockwise, we think that basically what's, what's happened is that people used to go over generations, went to stores, and it wasn't fun. And especially in the luxury industry, let me tell you, it's, it hasn't been fun to go to stores because employees were not necessarily properly trained. Not a good experience, not an emotional experience. Basically, people wanted you to go there and just buy stuff with or without information. And so then this thing moved to online, obviously, as we all know, and frictionless convenience, Amazon kind of ate the world on that aspect. But then I think we needed to, and what's happened is that there's been an emotional uplift of the online experience. And this is especially true in the luxury industry and specifically what we want to accomplish as well, obviously. So the two upper quadrants are where luxury players should actually be. Uh, and then the last one is the ultimate, right? So it's the in-store experience. Not only is it very easy to transact there, but you don't really go there to transact. You go there to have an experience. You go there to have an emotion, meet some friends, hang out, okay? Uh, and then you may purchase there, but maybe you don't purchase there. You get out of the store after a couple hours and you go purchase online. Easy peasy, right? So who's really good at this? Well, Apple is obviously very good at this. They kind of wrote the book. Amazon goes breathing down their necks on that. At least they're trying to create experiential shopping experiences as well. Apple has the highest uh, dollar per square foot in retail, which proves that it's definitely something that can be done. Um, they're actually not retail stores. I call them cathedrals or, or temples to the brand. They're not transparent by because it looks cool. They're transparent to send a message to the world that they're always full, and that's the case. Um, so in terms of uh, retail, there's a lot of innovation that's actually happened in the retail uh, world, uh, I believe. So we've seen pop-up stores, those have been around for a long time. It was kind of original when it came out. Very practical, obviously the investment in the pop-up store is a lot more long-term lease of a big building. Um, we've seen uh, one thing that's really interesting, especially in the US market, and very strongly as well in Asia, uh, mobile, mobile shops. It started with food trucks actually in the US, and then other industries kind of follow up on that, um, specifically uh, fashion fashion and also beauty, uh, cosmetics and so on. Uh, and so they're on wheels and that's a very flexible, we're actually very, very big believers in this, uh, in this physical retail delivery method because of its flexibility and because of its low cost of entry and its adaptability. And I'll go into that a little bit later. This one's interesting, now we're flipping the table, right? So I, could, I don't have to go to a store anymore, the store comes to me. I wanna buy a pair of sneakers, I wanna call this thing. There's enough people calling this, uh, this quote unquote truck will actually show up at a location. Same thing for this guy, except he's delivering groceries, he's driverless, it's completely automated, there's no environmental impact, it's electric. This thing travels anywhere and people can actually order food. This is, this is absolutely sensational. I believe this can be applied in luxury. I haven't seen it done yet, but 
is what it will happen. And this one is really interesting too because, you know, vending machines. How can you have luxury vending machines? Well, somebody in LA is selling really expensive caviar in a vending machine. This is also happening in Japan and other uh, Asian countries. You can actually buy uh, urchin and, and uh, lobster online. Uh, not online, I'm sorry, in vending machines. Uh, so there's a lot of innovation in retail, I think. Um, take away from this section, I think uh, retail must be about emotion first and experience. Retail can help you develop your brand and therefore increase your reach. Uh, retail, if you innovate properly, uh, can increase your yield and your margins. And retail is also a great way to do market research, especially with mobile retail. If you think about it, if you got a mobile entity somewhere, a movable entity, and it doesn't work out, you can go test the market elsewhere really quickly. You're not stuck in a building. So there's a lot of flexibility there. I think retail is far from dead.